Welcome to Modern Conservatives. I'm Hugo Gurdon, Editorial Director of the Washington Examiner. My guest today is Sir Roger Scruton, and it's not easy to introduce him succinctly because he's a, a novelist, a storyteller, a philosopher, an author uh, internationally acclaimed, I believe a librettist as well, is that correct? In fact, an opera writer. Yeah, I have uh, written operas, an opera unfortunately. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, I think what we'll do is we'll stick with philosopher, and, uh, and, and I, w I wanted to start right at the beginning. Um, last night at the Encounter Books Gala, you were awarded the Jean Kirkpatrick Prize for Academic Freedom, and Larry Arne of Hillsdale introduced you, and I thought he said something witty and, and clever, and that was that you had a privileged upbringing mm. because you were uh, not born into a family with money, and that uh, obliged you to work. Could you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and, and uh, what sort of household it was? Yes, I, I grew up in the suburbs of London. My father was a, a primary school teacher um, who himself had come, raised himself from the slums of Manchester, but always retained his working class uh, outlook. Uh, and he was a Labour Party member, a trade union activist, and all that. So, I, 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 and uh, lived in amid clouds of resentment directed towards the establishment, the upper class, and all the all the things that you can uh, work uh, into a frenzy about in, in England. So, um, I brought I was brought up in that atmosphere, uh, and um, we had no money. Uh, my father, who who ostensibly was in favour of education. Um, drew the line when it came to my education, <laughs> because that was getting ahead of myself uh, and disgracing the household by acquiring the wrong kind of values, I which see. I very quickly did, because I went to a grammar school, discovered culture, discovered books, music, uh, the, the higher life, uh, and um, ran away from home when I was 16, and that was it. Did your discovery of books and of culture and of, uh, of music, did that to some extent, or to a great extent, make you a conservative? No, I, I was apolitical. I, 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 th I had this wonderful sense, uh, really uh, exhilarated me, of belonging to this civilization uh, uh, and inheritance and wanting to know about it and to learn about it. But, you know, I'd absorbed from my father the rudiments of, uh, of normal socialist resentment, um, and I felt that's what one was obliged to feel. Right. But he shouldn't dominate one's life. It was a little, a little corner of it. Um, yeah. And when I went to Cambridge, like most of my students of my generation, I was fairly, um, fairly apolitical. But if if questioned, likely to lean to the left. Uh, but then I went to Paris after graduating to France, and I was in Paris during 1968. And I saw what leftism really means. You know, it means the destruction of that civilization that I had come to love. Right. Uh, and in particular, you know, in France, which was to me uh, an object of pilgrimage, mm. this place of high culture and, w and wonderful literature, uh, and um, and this history, you know, which would have been the, at the heart of everything. So, uh, and the beautiful architecture, of course, all that influenced me away from any leftist position. And when it came to observing the street battles between the Maoist students and the terrified policemen, I found myself on the side of the latter. Yeah, well, there's quite a lot of that now. Uh, uh, the, 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 the left is uh, inclined to, I mean, there's a big debate now about whether they should be called demonstrators or the mob. Yes. And, but you, the book that you wrote uh, on conservatism, which came out perhaps a couple of months ago here yes. in the United States, uh, has a subtitle of an invitation to a great tradition. Yes. Why did you feel that this was the right moment or the necessary moment to write this book? Um, <laughs> I didn't feel that at all, oh. uh, nor did I choose that subtitle, which yeah. is the, um, uh, you know, the publishers have you uh, by the goodies and they do what, what they want <laughs> with, your, with the manuscript once they've got it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and like everything I've written, I wrote it, um, not everything, but I wrote it because I wanted to. Uh, and also there was an opportunity to get a bit of money by way of an advance, oh, well, which that's... was very necessary at the time. It was a year ago that, I, uh, that it, well, I, it was published in Britain. 
one of the things that you write in there is that uh, conservatism at the moment uh, seems uh, somewhat beleaguered. Um, mm. Is it now more beleaguered, perhaps not than ever, but uh, more than it has been during your lifetime, and is that is what I had assumed was the reason that you you wrote the book? But no, uh, well, I, I have been writing about conservatism ever since I discovered it as something there in my soul, which only had to be um, uh, sparked into life by those demonstrations in '68, and there it was forever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know whether it's more beleaguered now. It is. It has al always been the case, though, ever since I started writing on this theme, that in the intellectual world, uh, conservatism is not, review, re not viewed as a, a, a possible position which is, in, which is opposed to the various liberal left positions available. It's, it's not actually a possible position uh, it, 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 because it's not wrong, it's evil. I see. Uh, and that sense of the evil of the other side is something that the left have inherited from their own religious psyche. You know, they are people of the, who would naturally be priests and religious, uh, uh, people who define themselves as outside society. One of the, one of the characteristics of the modern left, which you've uh, commented on, as, as have others, is that through political correctness and intersectionalism, it seeks to uh, shut down debate. It seems to, it seeks to marginalize conservatives. As you say, that they are regarded as evil rather than having propositions that need to be debated. Um, is it central to conservatism, as I think I assume it is, uh, as it is to the founding of the United States, that conservatism believes that ideas should be debated and they should be uh, they should be spoken. Yes, uh, I think it's a fundamental part of the conservative tradition uh, that uh, politics is not religion. It's not the imposition of conformity from above by some sanctified elite, which is essentially the liberal position, mm. but, but it, that it's a form of, of continuous discussion between uh, diverse and possibly conflicting interests, an attempt to conciliate to arrive at a solution acceptable to everyone, which requires institutions like parliaments and the Congress and so on, and, and a rule of law, committees, and all the rest. So it's, a, it's about procedure, and it sees politics uh, as aiming to, to conciliate rival interests rather than, than to impose conformity. Is, is President Trump a conservative, and if so, how and how not? Well. President Trump is a, a difficult case. He, he has made it somewhat difficult to declare oneself to be a conservative in public. On the other hand, leaving aside his manifest um, personal eccentricities, let's say, um, it, it, what he has done uh, uh, has not been a million miles from what any other conservative would do. Uh, they're, they're, I, I myself object radically to the use of social media to govern a great country. Right. I, th I think it should be governed by uh, committees and discussions and all the other things, and that the president should not play a very prominent part in this. Hmm. But uh, it's not his fault, and it's partly Barack Obama's fault that the president has suddenly come forward as the, as the uh, CEO of a great company, yeah. rather than the, um, the, the father figure in the background. Hmm. Uh, to come back to um, the, w the point that we were discussing about the, the left seeking to shut down uh, debate mm. and to impose a kind of uh, a uniformity, uh, has that produced, as I seem to think, it, I think that it does, a, a, an, a, one of the characteristics of modern conservatism is a, a kind of irreverence. Uh, which is an odd thing. You think of conservative, conservatives are depicted and regarded by many people as being stuffy and, and, and not challenging things, but there seems to be irreverence amongst a lot of modern conservatives. Irreverence for the establishment, you mean? Mm. Well, I think that there is truth in what you say in that, in that there has been, since the 1960s, what many people refer to as the long march through, through the institutions as Gramsci, of course, called it, 
uh, it, whereby people on the left have installed themselves in prominent positions of power and it is recognized that the, the establishment is anti-conservative in the sense that it, it, it's based on a repudiation of, it, of the inheritance of our civilization rather than an affirmation of it. And you see that very clearly in universities. Um, the, the university administration uh, is frightened of the Antifa people and therefore gives them maximum free reign. But it is contemptuous of conservatives because they can be shut up. Uh, and uh, inevitably, uh, the response of conservatives, who are a small but articulate minority, is to sneer at this. Uh, I want to turn to the Supreme Court and um, the recent confirmation battle over Brett Kavanaugh. Mm. Um, at bottom, this was probably about abortion, but perhaps even beneath that was the idea that there are some people who believe that, uh, on the left, who believe that the Constitution uh, is a living document and should be interpreted variously as time goes by by judges of different opinions. And there are those who are textualists. And I remember it was Robert Bork in, in, in one of his books who was saying that surely one of the essential things about a law is that it doesn't change its meaning according to the person who's reading it. Is that, is, is that also a central part of conservatism, that words mean what they say, and they're not uh, unlike Humpty Dumpty, who says they mean whatever he wants them to mean? Uh, th this is a, a deep and really interesting question. Uh, you know, uh, in, in literary theory, we're often confronting the so-called death of the author thesis, that, that meaning is hostage to the reader, and it's be only because you read something that it has a meaning. Mm. Right? Uh, words are otherwise inert. Mm -hmm. uh, they they depend upon your thoughts in order to animate them. So you can't say absolutely that something means just what it, what it was thought to mean by the person who first uttered it. Right. You know, obviously um, uh, Shakespeare's great plays have acquired meaning over the centuries. But that doesn't mean to say that you can just say what they mean, what you, what they, what you want them to mean, as you say. So um, there is a big question here about how laws are and should be interpreted. Uh, and I think that it connects to a, perhaps a deeper question, which is that, um, you, as Burke put it, we can only conserve if we also admit the possibility of change, that we change in order to conserve in other words, we had, our institutions survive by adapting. Mm. And I think the Constitution has, in that way, it does have to adapt a, to a certain extent to the, to the flow of human life. Mm. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean to say that it should be just used as an instrument to impose minority liberal values on the majority of Americans, which is what has happened. Right. It, one of the points you make in your conservatism book is that Social cohesion is what allows accountability, that the, the first person plural, the we, it, uh, uh, allows a, a society to be self-governing and governed in the way that it wishes. So does, the, does that suggest that as the left uh, as it pulls society apart, that the we is, and the we is, is disappearing, that there is a danger of an unaccountable government. Mm. And the, it's, there's an irony that a lot of people who criticize President Trump saying that he is uh, instinctively authoritarian, but is, the danger of the pos uh, is there a possibility of authoritarian government in the United States, do you think? And if, if it is, is it because the left is actually destroying the we, the first person mm. plural? Gosh, huge question. Uh, um, <laughs> but I, I would say, y yes. Um, accountability does depend upon some form of civic trust. The various levels of society, the various um, professions and ways of, of uh, forms of life, ways of gaining a, uh, a living and so on, uh, they have to be bound together in mutual trust before anybody feels that he has to account to anybody. Uh, and I think we had that trust and America especially, uh, you know, uh, and um, anybody who's traveled the world and seen the extent of its absence 
from everywhere, everywhere else, mm. will recognize that America was a, a, a society based on mutual trust in which people had that sense. After all, it's the first words of the Constitution, we the people. Yes. You know, uh, it's there. Uh, but of course, it's also the case that people on the left um, who are fundamentally snobbish uh, in their reaction, reaction to the people, they want to withdraw uh, from the contamination of those people out there mm -hmm. uh, and organize things according to their enlightened ideas. And uh, that's why whenever the left has taken power since the French Revolution, taken power fully, uh, accountability is the first thing to disappear. The next thing that happens, of course, is the gulags and the and the executions. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, actually, we're nearing the end of the discussion. I wanted to actually uh, return to a question which struck me in reading conservatism, which relates to the, the French Revolution. You, right at the start, you make the point that um, conservatism developed as a reaction or a response mm. to liberalism. And uh, correct me if I misinterpret, but my understanding of liberalism and the way that you write about it is that it, it's, it's, it's purely about ideas. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a mode of uh, thinking uh, directed towards government and society, which is entirely theoretical and doesn't draw on the customs of mm. the country. The, and, but is, w did conservatism emerge not just because con those who were conservative felt that the, the, the liberalism ignored the customs and, and therefore from the realm of theory, or was it because they looked at the results and they say, we, we don't want this to happen? Mm. Uh, a bit of both. Uh, I think uh, liberalism, as it was understood in, in the 17th century with John Locke uh, and Montesquieu and so on, was really, um, I mean, they didn't use that word. It's really what we would now call liberal individualism. The view that, that society was composed of individuals and that its legitimacy and political legitimacy depended upon individual consent. And these indiv individuals choosing freely, the sovereign individual, is the ultimate criterion of political legitimacy. And we all benefit from this because we are sovereign individuals. But what the conservative reaction said was, that's all very well, but, but, but uh, liberal individuals freely choosing uh, and engaging in consensual relations, they don't exist in a state of nature, mm. as Hobbes had famously said. Right. They only exist because they are born into a society which provides them with the customs, the institutions, and the settled ways of being, which enable them to be liberal individuals. Otherwise, they're a threat to each other. Conservatives are sometimes, uh, in fact, I sometimes think, feel this myself, even though I am a conservative, have a, 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 a tendency towards pessimism and the, feel, the feeling that things are going wrong. But you strike me as being opti an optimist. Mm. Um, and it, are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? How do you think things are going? I mean, I, I, well, I, I think I'm the kind of rational pessimist who is always agreeably surprised. You know. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, but I do think that, um, that there is a kind of duty to hope. Um, you know, not to hope necessarily for a radical transformation kind of thing, right. but to keep hoping uh, and to keep trusting in human nature and to be prepared to be amused by things uh, uh, and to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the spectacle of human folly as long as it doesn't wear you down too much. You know, much of what's happening now, the whole transgender movement actually is something which is profoundly comic uh, and we ought to be laughed, laughing a lot more than we do. Um, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to move from these, these subjects to the next book that, you're, that is coming out now. I've, I've got a copy here. I'm not sure if this is the, the, the galley or... No, that's, that's the real thing. That's the real thing. It's in paperback, so I wasn't yeah. sure. Just tell us a little bit about what you have here. I, it's, right. it's five stories. It's called Souls in the Twilight. Um, and this is so you've turned yourself to fiction. Well, I've recently. always written quite a bit of fiction. Um, but these sto the stories that have accumulated over a few quite a few years, and they're my attempts to get inside characters who are experiencing from within the uprootedness of the, of the multicultural societies in which mm -hmm. we live and looking for something to cling to. 
sometimes recognizing the, this as a religious need, sometimes not. And it's just tracing their adventures through the world. Some, some of these episodes are in Britain, some in the Middle East, you know, et cetera. But, but find, try to find themselves. And, and uh, my own view is there's a kind of poetry in the, in the lost, lostness uh, of modern people. And I'm trying to bring that poetry to the surface and um, at the same time tell an interesting story. Well, I, I look forward to reading it, and uh, I'm going to keep this copy if you'll allow me, and if Certainly. not, then I'm yes, going to get another copy. Um, so, Roger, we've this is the, come to the end of our, our time. Um, you talked about uh, pleasant surprises. I, uh, it's not a surprise to have you over here. It's a great pleasure that you, you're here, and thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you. <laughs>